Hello, Global Gardeners. Great to see you back here. Have you started it yet? Have you started looking at your garden season and figuring out what went right, what went wrong, what you're going to do differently? All this stuff, I think, is a wonderful winter activity. That's what we'll be talking about today. It's so nice to see you all here. Shout out to Jordan Marie Organics. It's been a while. Nice to see you. And of course, Heidi and Jay are here, our wonderful moderators to keep things on track. Let's go ahead and start with this comment from DLR978. I grade my 2023 garden performance as B minus. Production was a bit low, but I was still able to give generously. I made mistakes but I learned from them and helped others learn too. And that's exactly what I want to talk about today. And so I would love to see your inputs, your comments about some of the things you learned over the course of this year. You don't necessarily have to give yourself a letter grade, but, but that's the idea. Taking the time to analyze and do a little self-reflection as to how well your garden went. And I do this on a regular basis throughout the gardening season. So for those of you that are just about to enter, to enter your summertime, it's also a wonderful time of year to start thinking about that. So I tend to think that June 21st and December 21st are ideal dates on my calendar to stop and do that analysis of my garden. And I, I do tend to give myself a grade as to whether things are working well or not working well. So tell me what's going on with you and how well everything is or isn't working and what you're going to do differently. And of course, I'll be sharing my stories and my tips with you as we proceed. Sherry is saying, hey, Gardener Scott, woke to half an inch of snow this morning. After a whole Sunday of pouring rain, I'm getting my little peat pots ready to start the slow seeds like lavender. Good for you. Yeah, we talked about that last week, getting a start on some of those seeds that take a while to grow. <coughs> and I was uh, talking to a bunch of gardener friends yesterday. We had our our gardening holiday party yesterday. And so it's always nice to get a group of gardeners together and spend the afternoon talking about gardening and sharing some of those lessons learned. One of the things that I that I was able to discuss with some of the new gardeners that are part of the garden club is that seed starting. And the biggest problem I think many new gardeners make is they start seeds too early. And so one of my new garden buddies and I were talking and he was saying he started his tomato seeds last February. And it may not sound unusual for many of you, but I don't start my tomato seeds until April. And so his plants were big like crazy big when it came time to put them in the garden because he didn't fully understand exactly what the correct timing was. And he was starting some other seeds in February and just started everything at the same time. And I've mentioned this in some of my videos before as well, that you really do want to stagger your seed starting, not starting everything at the same time. This is one of those lessons we learn typically by doing it wrong and figuring out the hard way that if you start some of your seeds too early, they don't turn out well. And then others like the lavender and the rosemary in particular, if you don't start early, then they're not big enough as a plant to put out in your garden when you want to. So make note of those kind of lessons learned as you proceed. And it's the kind of thing that can make your gardening easier in the years to come because you're not wasting time. You are doing things at the right time. Dwayne's asking, what are drought tolerant plants that you can recommend? Anything that will adapt to less rainfall. <coughs> so I have a whole bunch of drought tolerant plants. There's some real good information on the Colorado State University website for uh, the Master Gardener, the extension program where they have the fact sheets and there are pages and pages and pages 
of drought tolerant plants listed for Colorado. And so states uh, generally that have an extension university will have similar fact sheets with, <coughs> excuse me, with the plants that are best suited for your environment. So I would suggest go ahead and check out your own uh, university that has an extension program and look for fact sheets for the specific varieties of plants that will do well in your area. But generally, there are a lot of ornamental grasses that can tolerate drought. And so I've got uh, the, the big grasses and the little grasses, little blue stem and big blue stem are ones that I have in my pollinator garden. There are a lot of perennial plants as well that can handle drought conditions. So, so Echinacea and Rudbeckia are plants that I'm growing in my garden. My Cosmos, I do, they don't uh, typically bloom till later in the season, but they can handle drought conditions as well. A lot of native plants like uh, the Gallardia and the Salvia, I grow those in areas that I pretty much never water and they have beautiful, beautiful flowers, particularly the Salvia I love growing because it attracts so many different types of, of bees in particular. And they can survive on the little bit of rain that I'll get during my spring and summer. So that those are a few that that I'll throw out at uh, throw out to you. But I suggest looking for your own native plants, and then as you learn more about native plants, see if they are appropriate for for drought areas. And uh, one thing that you can do, especially if if you can find a good resource, typically at a university or a college, is to just walk out in the fields and the forests and the parks where you live and see what's growing there naturally. And if you live in a dry area, anything that's growing naturally, you can probably consider is drought tolerant. And if you can find out more about identifying that plant, then you can put those same kind of plants in your garden. So that's that's an approach that I've taken over the years is to just see what's growing outside of cultivated areas and then try to identify it and find a variety that I like and then put that into my garden. Dwayne saying that uh, Alberta has had very little participation in the last year, two years, and it's been quite dry. Yeah, that's, that's uh, happening in a lot more areas. And so... Uh, Alberta, we, it does definitely have some similarities with Colorado in our winters and how we can grow. So uh, check out Colorado State University Extension and then look for some of those fact sheets and lots and lots of recommendations for trees, for bushes, for flowers, for grasses, uh, separate fact sheets for each of those categories with lots and lots of plants listed. And I continue to do more and more of that when I am looking for new plants. Um, I like to check to make sure it's going to do well in my area. And so that's a good resource that, that I really like to use. Uh, Wally Bruns is saying, when there's a deep freeze coming, I cover my orange tree with a heat lamp under it. Never a burnt leaf again. That's a great idea. Yeah, they, many of us, and I've talked about this periodically, here in Colorado, going into fall, we typically have that one day when the night is going to suddenly get really cold and then it warms back up again for a period of a few weeks. And so little tips like that on how to, to confront the freezes in your area and save the plants that will be damaged by frost and freeze, uh, that, that's a wonderful idea. Providing a heat source underneath a covered tree, particularly a citrus tree like that, can definitely buy you extra time and give you the advantage that you're looking for. Wormalus is saying groundhogs will eat tomatoes and leave the plants alone. That's a good lesson learned. Groundhogs, however, eat cucumber plants. So my goal next year is to get one singular cucumber that is good, which means I'll get 50 plus. Um, interesting. I don't have groundhogs, so I haven't had to to, to deal with them, but that's interesting. A lot of animals are that way. They'll eat one plant and not eat another plant. 
or they'll eat the fruit of one plant and leave the fruits of other plants alone. So uh, keep track of those kind of things, all of you, regardless of whether it's an insect pest or an animal pest. If you if you start tracking what they like eating and what they don't like eating, I, I'm a big fan, and I've talked about this before, of having the trap crops for insects or the sacrificial plants for animals. And I've done that with the deer where I'll put plants that I know the deer like in the edges of my garden so that they can munch on that on their way to something else like my neighbor's yard. But that keeps the, the inner plants in the middle of my garden less susceptible to the deer damage because the deer are eating what they like in a completely different area of the garden. And then they'll wander off usually away from the garden. And so I can have less deer damage. And you can do the same thing with the, the insect pests where you plant crops that particular insect pests like. So a couple years ago, I had uh, some flea beetles in the garden. They really liked my turnips. And so now I'll plant turnips throughout the garden as a trap crop. I haven't had flea beetles since, but when something like that comes in the garden, they're more likely to attack that particular plant, that turnip plant, and leave all my other plants, including other turnip plants, alone. So uh, wh whatever it happens to be, a cucumber can definitely be a sacrificial plant that you put in one area of the garden to keep the groundhogs away from the tomato fruit. So play with that idea. It can actually be a lot of fun as you start trying to figure out how those things work and how they can, uh, how plants and animals and insects can play well together. Jimmy says, I have a large family of rabbits five feet from my garden under the shed every year and they don't eat anything. Uh, I bet you they eat something, but if they're like my rabbits, they're eating the weeds. They're, they're eating the, the native plants that are growing around the edges of my garden. And, and it's, this is the same basic philosophy. Within my vegetable garden, I weed it. I pull up anything that I'm not intentionally trying to grow. But around the edges of my vegetable garden, I let all those plants grow. And so the rabbits never come into my actual vegetable garden. I've never seen any type of rabbit damage in, in my garden, but I have observed the rabbits around the edges eating what many of us consider weeds, but they're basically just native plants that are growing in the periphery. And I do have a few videos that you can see the rabbits. One, the when I was making the concrete block raised bed, in that video, you can actually see the rabbit running in the background. It doesn't happen as much anymore. Mala does a great job of keeping them away, but uh, they live under my shed as well. And they'll come out and they'll eat some of the, the weeds and help cut down on my, my trimming and mowing. And I actually live comfortably with the rabbits in the garden. They're not creating much of a problem at all. Gardens happen. Hello to you. My starts have been growing very slowly this year. I think it's the temperature. Uh, could very well. I know you've been having some cooler, cooler temperatures. Uh, one thing to to remember, and I was talking with one of my gardening buddies yesterday about this. If you're starting plants in a greenhouse or growing plants in a greenhouse during winter. It's not always the temperature that makes the difference. It's the light. And especially if your temperatures are warm enough that you can grow outside during the middle of winter, the plants are going to grow slower because they're not getting enough sunlight. It may seem like they're getting enough sunlight because there's more than six hours between sunrise and sunset. But the intensity of the sun is so much less in winter and the the angle of the sun in the sky is lower that the plants really aren't getting a, a full hour's worth of sunlight during an hour in a winter's day. So temperature might be a factor, but if they're if they're growing outside for you, it could also very well be 
the light factor that, that makes a difference. Sherry's wondering, have a, I have a heavy predator load here. Eagles, hawks, owls. Awesome. I heard an owl this or a hawk this morning screeching as I was outside. I love that. I'm more than a little concerned about baby mammals. I love to see roaming my land. The deer are the only ones thriving. Yeah, that's the trade-off. And there's there's a couple ways to approach it. So uh, another conversation I had yesterday was about foxes. And the, the gardener that I was talking to has uh, three or four foxes that she thinks are digging holes for dens in her front yard, acres of land, large, large yard. And she's trying to get rid of the foxes. And so another gardener and I were talking with her about that idea and we're asking about other things like, does she have rabbits? Does she have voles? Does she have mice? And she said, no, I don't have rabbits anymore. Well, there's there's a reason for that. The reason she doesn't have rabbits anymore is because she's got foxes. And I, I notice an increase in my mouse or vole population periodically. And then I'll walk outside and I'll see an owl roosting on top of my shed. And then suddenly my mouse and my vole population decreases. So that's the balance of nature. It, it's up and it's down because when the foxes come in and get rid of the rabbits or when the owl comes in and gets rid of the mice, then they move someplace else because they're not going to be hanging out in my garden anymore because their food source is gone. So who knows where they go, but they'll go someplace else. So, so Sherry, yes, it is troubling because I love seeing the, the rabbits, especially the little baby rabbits that come out. And I enjoy seeing a lot of that wildlife, but it is cyclical. Sometimes there's more, sometimes there are less, and it does coincide with the eagles and the hawks and the owls. And so I I suggest not, not fighting it, accepting it. It's part of nature. And then when you see the, the baby mammals emerge, uh, you, can, you can enjoy that. One thing that I've got, that, and, and I talk about it in my video where I set up uh, the, the nature habitat from the, the National Wildlife Federation. I have brush piles. So when I cut branches off my tree, I'll leave them in big piles. There are things like that that you can do if you want those mammals to stay in your yard. Give them protection. Give them a place where they can go and not have to worry about the predators, especially the, the flying predators who you know, typically an eagle or an, a hawk or an owl is not going to land on a brush pile and then dig into it to get some of those baby mammals. So take a look at those kind of things. If you really do want uh, to have a, a good balance and you want to keep some of those mammals, think about putting some of the protection in place that, that those mammals uh, need to, to stay away from those predators. Uh, so, so let's let's talk about the topic at hand. I'll throw some things to you of the lessons that I've learned this year as I'm getting ready to plan next year. And I and I think it it plays well together. That's why I say I'm always doing that analysis and I'm always looking at at the results of my efforts, not only to learn from them in the past or from the past, but to plan going into the future. And so this is a picture of my garden this morning. And you may have seen the, the video I did talking about the, putting the, the pergola up. And I've, I've talked about that in live streams as well. And this was a really important lesson for me. I gardened for many, 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 many years without planning, without putting together an overall garden plan. I would have some beds and I would add more beds and I would do some pathways and I would do some structures. And I would do that over a period of years, just always adding on to my garden without an overall plan. But when I moved to this house four years ago, I, I created a plan and I show that in videos from four years ago, everything laid out for what I was 
going to be doing as I constructed this garden space that you all can see in my videos now. Well, in the center of my backyard, I wanted to have a structure and I planned the location and I planned the size. And part of that plan was to surround it with fruit bushes. So I've got gooseberries and currants and choke cherries and honey berries in the corners around my pergola. Well, I knew as far as the budget was concerned that it was going to be a few years before I could put the pergola in, but I could put the fruit bushes in. So that was one of the very first things I did in my garden was to put those fruit bushes in knowing that it, they usually take three or four years before you get fruit. And I did all that by measuring the space and marking where the pergola was going to be and where I was going to put those plants. And also knowing that the structure was going to come after the plants were grown, three years old at least. So when I put the pergola in this year, what it taught me was it works. I, I put that structure in place and when it's done, my measurements were off by maybe six inches. The, the choke cherries in particular are about six inches too close to the corner from what I would prefer. My currants are perfect. The gooseberries are in the ideal location. And I had a wonderful choke cherry harvest this year. And I did all of that by just looking at what my plan called for on a sheet of paper that I had done years before. And this was really a, 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 a good lesson for me. It, it justified all of that planning, all of that action, and really told me that if you're serious about developing a big space like I did from scratch, you can plan out the sequences of when you're going to put the plants in, where you, when you're going to put the structures in. And as long as you stay pretty close to that plan, it's all going to work out. So I, I just amazed myself that, that I validated that concept so well, and I'm so happy. And next year, I hope to have a, a big current crop, and I'm crossing my fingers that maybe next year I might have honeyberries. And of course, I'm expecting that the gooseberries are going to return and give me more pounds of, of fruit. But it all began by just putting the ideas down on paper. So absolutely, absolutely love that idea. And that's why I wanted to share it with you today. Sherry's saying, I have a vision of a tent made of cables leading to a high central high point with wisteria climbing the wires to create a big top. Any thoughts on how to make that happen? Yeah, same basic idea is to identify the most important parts of a structure like that and measure it and then start putting the pieces in place. And so how big a tent do you want? Is it going to be 12 feet wide? Is it going to be 20 feet wide? How is the, the tent going to be anchored? You'll have that center pole, but you'll need to have anchors around the, the edges for those cables in particular. And so as you start thinking about what that end result is going to be your tent, now you can start thinking about the actual construction. I knew I was going to put a structure in the middle. I didn't know exactly what it was going to look like, but I knew the size and I knew the location. Start with that with your tent, the size and the location, <clears throat> and then figure out the, the, the main pieces. And so particularly with the wisteria climbing the wires, I would think that the anchor, so you might have one of those like screws, those big three foot screws that you screw into the ground and it has a big eye on the top of it. And that's where you attach the cable. You could put those in this year, put those anchor points in and plant your wisteria because the wisteria can take many years to grow to the height that you're talking about. And depending on, on your budget, your timing, that could be the start. <clears throat> just the anchor point and those plants. Because that center pole 
doesn't necessarily need to go in right away. And, and if you don't like the idea of just a pole sitting in the middle of your garden for a couple of years, wait on that one. So this year you put the anchors and the, the plants in. Next year you put the pole in. And then a year after that, you put the, the canvas or whatever type of, of cover you're going to have that makes your tent. And you put the wires in place. And then every year after that, you just train the, the wisteria. Now, if it's not actually like a canvas tent, if it's just a series of cables and, and, the, and the wisteria climbs between the cables and that's what creates your tent, same basic idea. You can start with the, the wisteria plants and putting some of those anchor points in whenever you have the time for it. And they don't have to be all done at the same time. Maybe do four anchor points this year. And then next year, do four more in between those four. And then the next year, you add eight in between those eight. And before you know it, you've got 16 wires that are going to be going up to that central pole, whatever it happens to be. And you can make it a, a, a process over time. So there are some thoughts that, that I would throw to you that uh, that's how I would approach it. And that's kind of how I approached uh, my pergola as well, was doing it sequentially. I put those plants in place. Then I, I, I built the, anch the, uh, the concrete anchors beneath the, the pergola because those, those legs that you see on my pergola are actually anchored into two feet deep concrete tubes. And then I put the, the subsurface on with the gravel and the sand, and then I put some concrete pavers on. So it took time over a period of months when I actually did start constructing it, and I just did it quite sequentially. Then I put some pathways. You haven't seen those in videos yet. I put some concrete paver pathways around the, the pergola. I'll be adding more pathways. And so for me, it's a multi-year process. But it started by putting the plants in. Maybe putting the wisteria plants in is your first step as well. Hey, Joe and Corky, Grow Big TV. Thank you so much for that contribution, that super chat. Thank you for sharing everything you do to help the community grow. I appreciate that. And thank you for all of your efforts and on your channels as well to, to give us more information to watch and listen to. Yeah, check out the Grow Big TV. I did that, that joint uh, show a couple weeks ago, and uh, they've had some good guests and good discussions on on the videos they've done in the last couple of weeks. So always wonderful to do that. Shandy's Garden is working and listening. Nice. It's always good to have you here as well. I'm glad that, that you can listen as we're talking about all these wonderful things. Uh, Dusty Flats is saying, so hoping to see honeyberries next year. Had a few blueberries and blackberries this year. I think growing fruit is just so much fun and so enjoyable. I'm planning on making gooseberry jam this week for the holidays. And so I'll, I'll let you know how that turns out. But I was so glad to get the gooseberries this year. And I, I just think if you're at all interested in growing fruit, do it. Whatever it happens to be that's going to grow in your area, just do it because it is wonderful to, to have all of those wonderful harvests and some of them like my raspberries don't even make it into the kitchen most of the time because i'll be out working in the garden and munch on some raspberries and then go do something else and come back and munch on some raspberries so i i just love that it's just a wonderful way to do it jordan marie organics i learned that ground cherries are temperamental to start from seed but the ones that do grow get huge awesome yeah i've i've had a really hard time uh, attempting to grow the ground cherries in in my area uh, and starting from seed, I completely agree with you. Definitely temperamental. I've tried starting them directly outdoors. That just doesn't work. Starting them ahead of time and then transplanting works a little bit better, but good for you. I've yet to get a huge harvest of ground cherries. It, it's definitely one of those things that I think uh, not only is the seed temperamental to get started, but the plant can be temperamental and and it, it does prefer 
a soil that I don't necessarily have. So I haven't tried growing it in recent years, but uh, good for you. Absolutely. Sherry saying wisteria grows like a weed here. It's almost like kutsu. I want a mixture of white and purple and there will not be a solid roof of canvas. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, that, that sounds wonderful. Having a blend of colors like that and then being able to get that growth. And yet another reason why you might want to start with the anchors in place when you put the wisteria in, because uh, once it takes off, it can grow pretty quickly if it's grown in the right area. Serena says, did you see my question between gardens happen and grow big TV? Uh, I didn't. I was scrolling down. So let me go ahead and I'll scroll back up and see if I can see if I come across it. I'm not seeing it right now. Go ahead, go ahead and um, post the question again. I'm, I'm not seeing it pop up as I do another scroll through because uh, there's a lot happening right now on this as well. Boothby Gardens is saying, I get ground cherries every year. Awesome. Planted one year and ever since squirrels have ensured I get more plants each season. That's good. That's one of those those plants I'm a bit envious of because I've tried growing it and just had minimal harvests. And I'd love to get as, as many of the ground cherries like I do with my cherry tomatoes, but that hasn't happened yet. And we'll just I'll just have to keep my fingers crossed and, and try it again at some point. And that's one of the things um, I'm planning on talking about it uh, in a video coming up. But this, this ties back into that that lessons learned category. So as I've uh, been growing the plants over the years, and you've seen me talk about some of my favorites. So for instance, I love my black creme tomatoes and I love the, uh, the, the cherry tomatoes like the sun gold. And I love growing the, the black beauty zucchini. So there are plants that that I've been growing on a pretty regular basis because I like them so much. But next year, I really want to stress myself to the point where I'm, I'm looking to failure. I'm anticipating failure so that I can learn from that. One of the best ways to learn gardening is to fail at gardening and then analyze what happened, what went wrong and then use that moving forward. And so the way I'm going to do that for next year is I'm going to try to grow most of my garden plants that I haven't grown before, varieties that I haven't tried before, plants that don't normally do well in my area to really stretch myself and really try to figure out what I need to do this time to make some of those plants a, a success where they haven't been a success in the past. And so ground, ground cherries are on that list for me because it's one of those things that I just stopped growing it years ago. Didn't do well, didn't spend a lot of time trying to figure it out, and then just stopped growing it. And so if you really want to push yourself and really want to, to learn more about gardening, look back on your season and try to figure out how easy it was or how hard it was. This year was an easy tomato year for me. I didn't have to work for tomatoes at all this year. I measured the soil temperature, so I didn't put them in the ground until the soil was warm enough, and that delayed my season. But once they started growing, it was great. Well, I, I like easy gardening, don't get me wrong, but I wanna push myself this year and maybe grow some tomato varieties that are a little more challenging, do some things that are different about those tomatoes because what I learned this year was that tomatoes are easy. I've said that before, that I like growing tomatoes because I can get them to grow in my Colorado garden. Very easy. So why not grow something that's not so easy and then figure out which is best and which, which approach I'm going to take as far as choosing plants more into the future. And I, I think that can be a, a fun option, especially when things don't always work out as they, I hope they do. 
Serena is saying, how many Job's Tears seeds do I need to plant to get enough to grind into five pounds of flour in zone 7A? I have absolutely no idea. I've never grown Job's Tears and never ground them into flour. So um, I wish I could give you an answer for that. The um, th there's, there's bound to be more information out there that you can find to, to see how many... Uh, how many seeds I, I would I would start by weighing the seeds because there is a, a pretty close correlation. If you ground a pound of seeds, you should be able to get a, a pound of flour. So the first step would be to get some seeds, weigh them, count them, and that should give you an idea of how many seeds you're going to need to get five pounds. And no doubt it's going to be thousands of seeds. So then the then backing it up still is to figure out how many seeds you're going to be able to get from a single plant and then multiply that out to how many plants you're going to need to be able to, to get that amount of flour. But but I can't give you a specific answer because um, I haven't ground seeds like that into flour and I haven't grown that plant. So uh, I'm not even familiar with how big that, that seed happens to be. That isn't a plant that I'm familiar with um, here in, in Colorado. And you know, I've got a, a, a 5B garden. And so it might be that the Job's Tears is just uh, not suitable for, for my climate and my hardiness zone, which is why I, I can't think of anyone I know, any of my local gardener friends that grow it as well either. So. Um, yeah, just start with the seeds and do some math and hopefully that'll give you an idea that, um, uh, that'll give you the information you need to plan how many plants you're going to need to put in the ground. Uh, let's see my two labs. I love those labs. That looks like Rosie and Lily. I had a black lab named Rosie and a yellow lab named Lily. You can see Lily in some of my older videos. So I love your two labs. Does the white butterfly live in the soil? I covered my plants, but they still got in. Any suggestions? So there are a number of white butterflies, but yes, there are some types of white butterflies that will lay eggs on the, the, the stems and leaves of plants. And then after the eggs hatch, the larva will burrow into the ground. There are other caterpillars that will lay eggs in the ground and then the larva is in the ground and then they emerge from the ground. So uh, depending on where you are, it, I would suggest trying to figure out exactly what kind of white butterfly you have. And then that'll give you some opportunity to look into its life cycle and where the eggs and where the larva actually reside. But that, that is a relatively common problem for many gardeners that have insects that, at least in the larval form, will be in the soil. And then when they emerge, your plants are growing and they munch on your plants. And then you, you have all your plants eaten by the, the, the larva, the caterpillar form of that moth. Uh, a, a way to help prevent that, particularly in the spring, is to cultivate your soil. And so I'm a big fan of adding amendments in fall to give them time to incorporate into the soil. But spring amending is also a great idea, especially if you live in an area and you have an insect pest that has its life cycle as part of the soil either the eggs or the larva is going to be in the soil. And so if you amend in the spring and you're disrupting that top six or seven inches of soil as you're amending it, you're also disrupting the life cycle of those insects. And so you can amend your soil in spring, work up that soil, then cover it to keep them out. And you'll have fewer problems with basically covering your plants and what you do is you're you're covering and keeping the insects in and their only option is to eat your plants. So um, identification is really the key um, as to uh, uh, figuring out what the what the butterfly is 
and where the caterpillar lives. And that's how you can help take care of it. Bohemian Herbology is saying, watching the ground cherry chat. Thanks to all. Seems like it a little on the wild side. Going to definitely get some in the back 40 this year. Awesome. Yeah, they, I, I don't live in an area where they grow wild, but I've seen some pictures of patches of the ground cherries that do just go wild. So if you got the space, go for it. I like that idea. Uh, okay, let's see. It uh, looks like Joe or Jay was working on a link for Serena. So uh, there we go. That's science info information. So thank you for that, Jay. Always appreciate it. And um, I'm, I'm guessing, Serena, that they do need cold stratification. Um, but maybe you'll find that in, in that article that, that Jay posted. Uh, for the most part, um, any of the perennial plants that we're growing in zones three, four, five, six, seven can benefit from cold stratification because those plants are going to be exposed to cold temperatures in winter. And generally, those plants that, that we put in our gardens will benefit from the cold stratification and germ germinate better. So it can't hurt anything to put them in their, their seeds in the refrigerator for a month, and it, it might actually benefit doing that extra research to find out if it actually needs a 60 day period or longer is something to to look more into and that's why i, I like prairie moon nursery i've mentioned them before uh, the prairie moon nursery has a great insert in their their catalog i haven't got this year's catalog yet but it lists a lot of those type of plants and tells exactly what kind of stratification the seeds need so uh, that's that's a good catalog if you're looking for for native plants and trying to figure out what the certification might need. And from there, you can move forward with the, the information you need to, to figure out exactly how you're going to grow it. Jen is saying, interesting, ground cherries grow like weeds for me. I haven't planted them in year, three, two years, but they keep coming up. I'm in a warmer and wetter climate, multiple plants, varieties. So there you go. Yeah. A, the climate definitely makes a difference, and and that holds true with a lot of plants. If you if you want to grow a big patch of something, grow a couple different varieties, and uh, the the cross pollination and the the plants growing side by side like that can usually benefit both varieties. Uh, if you are growing all of the same variety you'll get good harvests and everything will be fine. But there's a lot of plants out there that, that really do better when they can cross-pollinate from uh, something similar, even squashes. If you're not worried about saving the seeds and moving forward, then plant different varieties and you'll usually get better results uh, after after that cross-pollination. The fruit tends to be a little bit bigger, tends, the plant tends to be a little bit healthier, and multiple varieties is, is definitely the approach that I like to take. Tomatillos are a real good example like this. And tomatillos look like a ground cherry with that husk covering around them. You've gotta have at least two tomatillo plants or the plant's not going to really produce fruit at all. And if you have different tomatillo plants, the fruit's gonna do better on both plants. So that's that's something that won't surprise me at all about ground cherries. If you grow multiple varieties, you'll definitely have uh, more of a harvest. Sherry saying the story of the white butterfly sounds a lot like the huge C5 carpenter bees that drill into my cedar siding and the untreated rafters of my porches. They eat wood. Yeah, carpenter bees can be an issue. And that's another one of those things that uh, if you have a pest like that and, and you're not sure what to do about it, learn the life cycle because you might be trying to get rid of that pest. And in the process, you're actually keeping it inside your house to eat all of the wood as opposed to keeping it out of the wood. And so 
uh, whether it be an ant or a bee or any of those other pests, sometimes the the fixes that I've seen people recommend can actually make the problem worse. So learning the pest and trying to attack it before it causes damage, while it's still at that young stage, is is what I found actually tends to to work well for me. Bowtie life, hello, nice to see you here today. Having trouble with the word stratification. The word, the root suggests layering where the root for vernalization suggests cold. This confuses me a lot. Can you clarify? Sure, absolutely. And I've got a video on this. No doubt Jay is going to post a link to it here momentarily. And so when we talk about stratifying seeds, we're talking specifically about the cold and exposing that seed to a period of cold temperatures. And it's it's as simple as that. And so generally, when we stratify our seeds, we can put them in the refrigerator. Temperatures lower than 40 degrees Fahrenheit, about four and a half Celsius, are usually enough to, to be cold for those seeds. It doesn't have to be freezing cold. Those of us that live in areas where our ground freezes will get that that freezing cold in our soil outside. But as far as the, the seeds before we germinate them, the refrigerator is almost always cold enough for those seeds. <clears throat> and then the key is the period of time that they need. So I'm, I've been planning a video for a long time. It's, right now I've got it scheduled to come out in January talking about chill hours. And it's the same concept for a number of plants that we grow, particularly fruit trees. They need a period of time with cold temperatures, usually below 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And once they have that cold, it stimulates them to produce fruit. If those trees don't get that cold, they're not going to produce fruit, which is why you don't generally see apple trees growing in Arizona or Florida because they're not getting the chill hours that the apple tree needs to produce fruit. The same is true for seeds. Some seeds need the chill hours. They need those cold temperatures to be able to even germinate. And that whole process is called stratification. And, it, and so because the stratification is usually talking about the cold temperatures, it's, it's a bit of a redundancy to say cold stratification, but you'll you'll hear that term used. And so usually to help clarify, I'll say cold stratification is what you're looking for for your seeds. So hope that helps. That's that's the basic answer for for what stratification is. And it doesn't necessarily match the the specific Latin root or definition for other things that you might stratify. It is pretty specific when we talk about it uh, as far as the seeds are concerned. So Gardens Happen is planning on doing ground cherries. It's so nice to see all this talk on ground cherries. So it looks like I'm going to have to make a video about ground cherries next year. So definitely look for that as we move forward. Dusty Flats is saying irrigation could be simple to install. We didn't dig it in or with timers, but great info at Colorado State University. Drip irrigation for home gardens is the best info I've found. Uh, yeah, thanks for posting that. I, you know, like I said at the beginning, uh, Colorado State University has got some fantastic fact sheets on all kinds of topics. And it's not just for Colorado. There's a lot of information, like you point out, that could definitely be used in, in other areas. Um, and Alora is saying that the ground cherries did nuts in the Denver garden. Okay. Well, you're, you're 1500 feet lower than me. And so I think the altitude does make a difference. My shorter season, I think makes a difference. Uh, a couple of years ago when I was growing ground cherries, the plants were doing okay, but we had an early freeze and I wasn't able to get a harvest. So um, I think maybe that's the approach. And again, this is how we look at our lessons learned from gardening. And as I look back and think about what didn't work, it's that my season wasn't long enough that year. And so with hoops and plastic, 
uh, that may be that extra advantage I can give myself to grow ground cherries. So if you see a ground cherry video next year, my guess is I'll show you that I'm using the hoops and plastic so that I can get the, the extra time in my season that I really need. North Chester County News. Have you ever talked about making tinctures and salves with herbs? I did plantain, oregano, goldenrod, comfrey, and lemon balm this year. Good for you. I haven't yet. Um, I talked about that about a month ago or so in the stream, how I've been adding more and more herbs to my garden with the intent of, of learning more about using them medicinally and then making uh, a video that shows that as well. And at, at uh, my garden club meeting a couple months ago, we had a speaker that was talking about making the tinctures and the salves. And uh, I talked with her a little bit. And it's definitely something that I'm interested in. But no, I haven't actually done that yet. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm moving in that direction. And that, that can actually play well with my plan for this next year's garden, growing some of those plants that I haven't grown before. And then also using those plants in ways that I haven't done before. So that's a that really is a big strategy of mine moving into next year is to really try different things. And I, I'm not saying that I'm tired of how I garden or I'm bored with gardening. Uh, it's just I've been doing some things in my garden the same way for more than 20 years. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but, but I want to stretch the limits a little bit. You, you know me, I know, I know an awful lot about a lot of gardening topics, but there's a lot more to gardening that I don't know. And that's what I sp spent some time with, um, with this year is identifying holes in my own gardening education and trying to figure out how I can fill those holes and learn even more. So you can never know everything about gardening. And I think you can never know as much as you'd like to know about gardening, but you can try. And so that's that's what I'm going to be doing as I, as I move into next year. And it, the foundation was this year and what worked and what didn't work and how I move forward with, with all those kind of things. So Wickershire Project off-grid, thank you for that. Um, it, yeah, the cold activates certain internal proteins that puts the seed in stasis, a dormancy, typically in cold climate grown fruits. There you go. So thank you for adding that to the discussion. And it, it's, um, I actually need to check. The one thing when you stratify your seeds, and I learned this the hard way this last year, is I I put a whole bunch of seed packets into the refrigerator. And some of them are 30 day stratification, some are 60, some are 90. I did a really good job a couple years ago. I think it was two years ago. I did a video and I, I showed how I labeled how long the seeds need to be in the refrigerator. And then I put it on the calendar and I pulled those seeds out at the appropriate time and germinated them to, to grow. Most of them were native plants and perennial flowers that I wanted to add to the garden. The mistake I made this last year is I had a lot of those seeds in the refrigerator. And when it came time to actually start germinating seeds, I, I forgot and lost some of those packets that were buried in the refrigerator. And it wasn't until a couple months later that I came across some of those packages that were under a carton of eggs and I missed out in a, on an entire season of growing because the, they were in the refrigerator getting the cold they needed, but they weren't in the ideal location for me to actually see the packets and remind myself that those were some of the ones I wanted to pull out and germinate. So work on your system as well if you try those kind of things so the seeds don't get lost. And it's um, it, it won't set you back a whole year. Like sometimes I've set myself back because I don't always start the seeds that I'm hoping to, to start. So it's all part of the planning. Uh, thank you for that, Jay. That's a, that's a, a good overall. And that's actually, I have that... Um, 
I have a document, a Word document, where I have the the URLs, the links to sites that I like to visit on a regular basis. And so I've got this link actually on my my sheet so that when I'm looking for the fact sheets, I can open up that document, click the link and go right to it. So thank you for that. Yeah, lots of good publications at, at CSU. And you might find something that you didn't even know you needed to find on some of those, those fact sheet websites from uh, wherever your extension office happens to be. Sherry saying, funny vignette, when I was growing antique roses in Cali, my hubs installed a sprinkler system, didn't read instructions. And when it started, it blew out water everywhere. <laughs> that's, that, that's fun. The um, Yeah, I've, I've done a lot of my own sprinkler systems and a lot of my own irrigation and uh, understanding the instructions can be important. I've blown out a lot of heads a lot of nozzles, and uh, especially when you find out that you haven't tightened the O-ring long enough or tight enough when you have a, a coupler between two different hoses. That's another important lesson that you kind of have to learn the hard way. So uh, that that's, that is a bit humorous because there are many of us, I think, that have made those mistakes many times before. Uh, so Jay's saying... From Serena Norrell, I planted sage seeds Saturday before the overnight low was expected to be 24 degrees with a cold stratify them for sprouting in the spring without me watering them. Um, possibly, yeah. The, uh, I, I've got sage growing in my garden. It's a great perennial. It handles my cold, cold temperatures with no problem. And so generally, the seed, the, the plants that grow in cold conditions like that the seeds will benefit from stratification. And you can do that stratification in the refrigerator. You can do that stratification outside. <clears throat> and so if you planted your sage seeds out in your garden where you, you want the, the plants to grow and it's cold now and it's going to be cold for the month ahead, that is probably going to be enough to, to give that those seeds that cold stimulation that they need. Um, be careful about the, the concept of watering. I, I don't like allowing the winter soil to dry out because that can desiccate roots and it can desiccate seeds as well. So the, the seeds are not going to germinate until the ground temperature is warm enough for them to grow. So you can still water areas where you've put seeds, and that's not going to cause those seeds to germinate. Don't overwater them because especially if, if the soil is thawed and it's starting to warm out and it's not warm enough yet for the seed to grow, overwatering might lead to some issues with the seeds rotting. A lot of it depends on the seed. So I wouldn't totally discontinue the watering. I would consider occasional watering, and this holds true throughout the landscape in winter, is if you've got plants growing or newly sown seeds, putting a little bit of water in there uh, tends to help so that the, those seeds and those roots don't desiccate. So um, consider that as something that uh, takes extra work. And especially in an area like mine where my hoses are frozen, I'll hand water some of those areas to include my herb beds. I've got my two gallon watering can, fill it up, go out and then water the beds uh, as needed to just try to prevent the, the, the dryness. Now, this is a picture, as I mentioned, of my yard from this morning. And you can see that I've got snow on the ground. You've got a You've got to balance the snow you get in winter or the rain you get in winter with how dry the soil is. And so my ground is freezing now. It's not frozen solid yet because we've still had some warm days, but the sun has been warm enough to melt the snow and that is keeping the, the soil relatively moist because the evaporation is less in winter. So it doesn't take as much water to keep the soil moist. And as you as you look at your winter watering schedule, balance that with how much precipitation you're getting 
and actually dig into the soil. This holds true in the summer as well. Dig into the soil, see how moist it is, and that can help determine whether you need to add water or not and whether the snow melt has been enough for the, the plants that you have in that particular area. Uh, Bowtie life, and I always love uh, comments like that. I always told my kids growing up, the day you stop learning is the day you die. A bit morbid, I know, but also oh, true. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and especially when I see my grandkids, I always ask them, what'd you learn in school today? Or if it's a weekend, what'd you learn today? And they're good. They've learned that they need to give me an answer. But when I've asked that question, particularly of kids, and they say nothing, and I come right back at them. It's like, no, you learn something every single day. The secret is to figure out what it is you learned that day and make a point of remembering it as you move forward. And so absolutely, yeah, I I think we learn, we learn so many things each day. It's just a question of whether we take the time to figure out what it was we learned and how important a lesson it was. And especially in our gardens, Every day we should be learning something and hopefully keeping track of those things that we learned. Hi, Caroline, rookie gardener here in Northern Nevada. Been binge watching you. Awesome. Can you give them an update on your vermiculture? Do you add worms to your beds? When do they survive winter? Good questions. So I love Northern Nevada. I don't know if you know, but I grew up in Reno and had friends in Elko and, uh, I'm, I'm a Northern Nevada kind of guy. I spent a couple decades there in my, in my youth and don't have any relatives there anymore, but until relatively recently had relatives in Northern Nevada. So it's a challenging environment. I grew up in an area, not un, unlike my Colorado garden there in Nevada. And so I understand the winters and vermiculture. For those of you that don't know, that's that's raising worms, usually to get the worm castings, and worm castings are great. And so I've got videos on how to start with vermiculture, vermiculture with making your own worm bin, and how to feed the worms, and how to harvest. I've got all those videos. And so I haven't done an update in a couple years. Thank you for asking about that. Just yesterday, I was feeding my worms. And so I'm at the point now that uh, I, I am separating out what, what they've mostly eaten. So, so most of what I had in one of my bins is essentially nothing but the worm casting. So I've moved that completely to one side of the bin. And then in the other side of the bin, I put fresh food like banana peels and I, I save my tea leaves from my cup of tea that I have every morning. And so um, I started a whole new area with some shredded newspaper and some food for those worms. And so <clears throat> in a couple of weeks or so, I'll take out all of those worm castings and they'll have, for the most part, moved into the food area. And then I can separate out any worms that are left in the castings and, and use those for my potting soil. And I mentioned that this last or this year, this year I did some videos on potting soil. And that's one thing that I've done recently, just in the last couple of years that I didn't used to do. I use my own worm castings when I make my own potting mixes. And so it's such an easy way to add nutrition and to improve your potting soil blends by using your own vermicompost. So uh, I've, I've got it tentatively. It's on my list. I don't have it programmed yet, but I am planning a video maybe this next year where it'll be an update and I'll talk about how to use the worm castings. I did use some more of them since I've got more castings uh, in my garden beds because it's a great amendment. But to your point about the worms in my bed. So I'll, I'll take some of the worm castings and I'll put them in my garden beds. And I know that there's some eggs that are, are going to be in those worm castings. And I have found some of the worms in my garden beds a month or two later, whenever I added 
uh, verma compost, those worm castings to my soil. But the type of worms that I'm using, the red wigglers, can handle cold temperatures. In fact, if the temperature gets below about 60 degrees Fahrenheit, 15 Celsius, those worms essentially shut down. And when it gets colder, much colder than that, they die. And so they don't survive my winter. <clears throat> they're, they're just not able to function uh, unless the, the soil is warm and the air temperatures are warm. So while some of those worms will be transferred from my worm bins into my garden, I, I can guarantee you right now they're all dead. They only live in the top three inches of soil or three inches of your worm bin. And so, especially if you look at my beds covered with snow, that's too cold and they're, they're definitely not going to survive. And that's why I do them indoors in bins in a warm area. And then I can use the, the, the castings in my garden. And during the winter or during the summer, when they're, they're happy with the temperatures, they're fine. They're adding to the decomposition of the organic matter in my garden beds. Uh, it's the other worms that are burrowing deeper. And I've got a video, I'm sure you'll probably pop up this video. I got a video I did earlier this year where I talk about earthworms and the three different types of earthworms and how what you see in your garden is not the same type of earthworm that you will see uh, that you can buy online for or, or for composting your kitchen scraps. So all kinds of different types of earthworms and some can survive the cold and the freezing temperatures, uh, but others can't. Yankee Sista, always nice to see you here on Mondays. I was looking at some footage of your garden the other day and remembering what a wonderful visit that was. Ready to start brand new ventures in the 2024 garden. Thanks to Gardener Scott for all you've done in 2023. And thank you so much for all of your support and being there. Uh, yeah, brand new adventures in 2024 is kind of the underlying theme to the show today because uh, it starts with the lessons learned. What what happened in your garden that's going to carry you forward to the next year? And, and what are those new ventures going to be? Start thinking about it now because the seed catalogs are coming out now and it's time to get, heart, get ordering, especially if you wanna do something that is very unique. Talk, all this talk on ground cherries. There's a lot of varieties of ground cherry. Now, there, there's some of the, the common ones, was it Aunt Molly, um, that you can find everywhere. But there's some really cool varieties out there that maybe only one seed provider, maybe Seed Savers Exchange has some of those varieties that you can't find any place else. Well, they sell out of some of those really interesting varieties. And if you're not ordering and buying by the end of January sometimes, then you're not going to be able to get some of those really interesting varieties. And so start the process and, and give yourself a, a, a Christmas present to get some of those seeds that others might also be wanting. And uh, you know, every, every year that I look for new varieties, inevitably, I'll go to the website of a of, uh, seed company that I have the catalog for, and I'll have circled it in my seed catalog, and then I'll go to order it. Inevitably, at least one packet, sometimes more, are sold out, and I've lost out, lost out on, on that opportunity for, for the year. So early really is better when it comes to planning your garden, especially if you're going to be doing seeds and you need to order those seeds and, and get them to, to germinate on time. Really the best approach to take. Moon Dust, Moon Dust has plans for 2024 garden to get seeds started in grow bags. Want to rely on my garden for most of my food, then going to store for fruit and veg. Awesome. I love that. I love that plan. And the, the, the grow bags are a great option for starting seeds and then transplanting or starting seeds in the grow bags and then allowing them to continue and let the whole plant grow in the grow bag. So um, awesome. And storing the fruit and veg, 
that's what I always talk about, preserving, grow for preserving. And so this year uh, had a great year for preserving. And I, I, I did pickling, fermenting, drying, freeze drying, jelly and jam making. And so as I look to 2024 as well, that's always a factor when I select my seeds and figure out what I'm going to be planting in my garden. Is it something that I'm only growing to eat fresh or is it something that I can grow and then preserve? And so I talked many, many months ago about having the paste tomatoes this year in my garden. And I did. And I've got some big bags of tomatoes in my freezer that are harvested from those paste tomatoes and Italian paste and an Amish heirloom, the um, Grand or San Marzano, the Roma. All those tomatoes are frozen right now, and I'll be making some um, sauces and tomato paste from the, all of those tomatoes that last year my plan was to grow so that I could make sauces and paste. And now I'm at that point where I will be moving forward with that. So that's that's how it begins with an idea and then a seed. And especially if you could tie it into food that you're eating and preserving, great, great way to, to plan the whole process. Or Chester County News found a source of free potting soil. Local grocery store puts out dead potted plants for free that you can recharge in your compost. Awesome. That's that's a, that's a nice tip. Look for those type of things um, and, and definitely benefit from it. So um, good tip. Thank you for that. I, I've done that um, with end of season um, clearances, especially bigger pots uh, at, as well, where uh, at the big box stores, it's too late now. They've got Christmas trees where they used to have the garden center. But uh, same kind of thing, get plants at the end of the season and you can save money because if the plant is still alive, you might be able to, to put it in the ground and keep it alive long enough that it'll come back the next year. Uh, but also it's a good source to add to the compost and help revitalize your, your garden as well, depending on whether you can get them for free. And I did that, it's been years, but years ago I did that. Uh, at one of the big box stores and they were throwing a whole bunch of plants away and I just loaded it up and took it home and threw it all in the compost pile. And then when I harvested the compost, I had a bunch of perlite and that's okay. That just helps aerate the soil. So yeah, wonderful, wonderful tip. Thank you for that. Gregory is saying, hello, hello to you. I learned the importance of early soil testing. We moved part of our garden last year to a different spot and there we planted the tomatoes after later testing the pH was too high. Disaster. Um, thank you for sharing that. Yes, absolutely. So early soil testing is an important thing. And, uh, and, and I've learned that the hard way as well, where things just aren't growing in an area. And then you do a soil test and find out myriad issues whether it's the pH or the nutrient levels or contamination, there's all kinds of things that you can never guess by just looking at the plants. You got to do the soil test. So thank you for sharing that, Gregory, because I, I totally agree with that. Uh, I think I've got a link in the description below. It's one of the companies I work with, the RX Soil Testing, and they're real good. I did a video earlier this year with them as well where they they send you a kit and you put your soil in it and send it back to them and everything is included in in the box they send you and then usually within a few days they're pretty fast you've got the analysis that tells you what's happening with your your garden soil so um, that's that's one of the sources i use the rx soil link and uh uh, and yeah, I think you can use the Gardner Scott code to save money on that as well. So soil testing is, is a good idea. I gardened for so many years without doing soil testing. And now that I'm doing soil testing, th the results just speak for themselves because I am in the soil and I'm in the soil and I'm in the soil. 
and then test and see like, yeah, now, now the soil is really rich and I don't need to amend this year. I'll give it a year off and then I'll start amending again. So always, always a good way. Yeah, there's Jay on top of it. There's the video or there's the link to RX soil with the Gardner's got 10% off. Okay. I'd forgotten how much the discount was. So thank you for that, Jay. RX soil um, is, is an easy way to do it. And, it, and it's electronic. The report they send you, um, I've also sent soil to Colorado State University and they sent back a paper printout. Uh, but when I'm sitting at my laptop and trying to remember what the, what the soil was, it's easier for me to just pull up that file that has my soil results that RX gave me. And you know, I can't, don't always remember where I filed the paper that I got from Colorado State. Serena saying, I planted cucumber seeds last year outside instead of starting them in peat pots indoors and something ate them. What do you suggest using to protect them and keep this from happening? So <clears throat> again, hopefully you can do a little detective work to try to figure out what ate them because the, the solution is basically the same, but, but the material is different. So most of the time, a barrier is what we want between our seeds or plants and whatever it is that's eating them. And so if it's an insect that's eating them, you need something like a row cover material that is dense enough that, that the insects can't get through. If it's an animal that's eating them, like a bird, then bird netting is all you need to keep the birds away. And that's a that's a common combination. The birds will eat your seeds. And that, that may be something you want. I like birds in my garden because in spring, they'll also eat the insect pests. And so I leave my perennial flowers up and let them go to seed so that the birds have seed in my garden. But in my vegetable garden beds, I don't want them eating the seeds. And so I'll put bird netting over the, the areas that I've recently sown, especially when the bird activity is high. If it's an animal that is eating the seeds, same basic idea, but you may need something sturdier than just a bird netting. So uh, look for tracks, look for holes to see if something was digging a hole to eat the seed and look for mounds to see if maybe it was a mole or gopher that was eating it from underneath. But, but that's really the best approach to take to figure out the best solution. If you can't identify it and you really don't know exactly what's eating them, then, then start with row cover. Put the row cover over your beds and see if that solves the problem. And that, that may show you that it was a, a bird or a, um, an insect because the row cover will keep both of those off of your plants. Um, okay, and so they they got eaten just after sprouting. So yeah, that opens up the, the, the conversation to a lot of potential insects and a lot of potential animals. Uh, for small seedlings, generally it is going to be an insect, like a, a caterpillar or a beetle that might be eating those. Uh, there aren't many birds that are going to be eating your seedlings, but there are some. And so you can kind of work backwards, identify what birds you have in your garden. And by identifying the birds, you can look at what their diet is. And then that can help you identify whether they're seed eaters or whether they're fruit eaters or whether they're insect eaters. And a lot of birds have different diets at different time of the year which also can make a difference. So for the seedling stage, I'd suggest putting row cover fabric over your plants and, and see if that makes a difference. And I'm guessing that it, it probably will. Uh, yeah, Tennessee Nana says, I use Thule. Same idea. Thule is a great fabric to put over your seeds and plants. And you can find it at any fabric store, including Walmart and uh, the, the big craft box stores as well. So uh, that's a that's a great idea. Uh, and and so the 
the the difference would be because Thule is great, rope rope cover fabric is great. I, I just use or I just look at the the cost and how big a roll, how wide the roll is, because my hoops are a size that I need at least six feet of material side to side over my beds, and I need them at least 10 feet long. And so I tend to go with the row covers because someplace like greenhousemegastore.com has row cover fabric that you can find in, in big sections like that. But uh, Thule, a, a bolt of Thule might not be the right size, but you can sew pieces together to give you the custom made fit over your garden beds as well. And I do want to say to, to Tennessee Nana and, and anyone else you might have, friends or family in Tennessee, our thoughts definitely go out to you. Terrible, terrible storms and tornadoes that Tennessee has been experiencing in the last couple of days. So hope everyone you know is safe and didn't have uh, damage, or at least if the damage was there, it wasn't too much because severe weather like that really is is harsh jay dixon thank you for posting that simplified gardening has a live stream in just under two hours beat the cold expert strategies to keep your winter gardens thriving and as of right now the plan is for me to be on that show with tony and so tony o'neill on the simplified gardening channel has the live stream coming up in just under two hours so uh, join us as, as we talk about winter gardening and a whole bunch of questions we're going to be covering and talking about. So uh, if you're at all wondering about uh, growing, sowing, harvesting, anything that happens to be uh, in that larger winter gardening category, we'll be talking a whole bunch about it. I'm, I'm not sure how long it's going to last, but when Tony and I get together, we usually talk for a long time. So um, thank you for posting that, Jay. I appreciate that link. I'll be posting that on my social media uh, when I get off here in just a few minutes. About 10 minutes from now, we'll be ending the show today. And I'll go and make sure and put off, put that link on my community page and Facebook page in case you're, you didn't get it in what was just posted. Sherry says, the books I have on permaculture recommend what you often say about trusting cyclical seasons, re thrive and starve of various species. I don't want my raptor birds to starve just waiting. Um, yeah, good point. And I don't, I don't often point out that much of what I do is, is similar to or the same as permaculture principles or permaculture philosophy. But you're exactly right. Uh, I, I, there's much about my garden, particularly my, my fruit area and how I am treating my animals that have direct links to the permaculture concepts. And so you're exactly right. And, and much in that area that I talk about comes from the books I've read and the experience I have and a, a gardener, buddy I have that actually runs the, the Permaculture Institute here in my area. She's the one that actually teaches you to become a certified permaculture planner. I've been tempted to take that class for a number of years, but um, I may do it sometime. I don't know. We'll see. But yeah, permaculture principles, I think many of them really can be tied into our backyard gardens. And, and so... Uh, understanding the cycle of nature, of everything in nature, from the plants, the seeds, the soil, the predators, the prey, all of that. When you start understanding more and more about how all of that works together, and that's the big part of permaculture, is, is working so that it is all in harmony, the good and the bad, is only good and bad because we think it is. And so some of those things that we think are bad, like foxes in our yard, I think can be good because they're getting rid of, getting rid of the voles and the mice that might be causing a problem in your yard. So for you know, one person's problem is another 
person's answer. And so I, I like to look at my garden that way and let everything hopefully find that equilibrium. That's the word I use is equilibrium in, in the garden. So uh, I'm, I'm glad you're, you're aware of permaculture. For those of you that aren't familiar with permaculture, it's a great time of year to learn more about it and maybe get some of those books that are printed, look, some, look at some of those websites and start educating yourself on some of the principles. There are the permaculture principles and that's really the foundation of starting your learning with permaculture. And absolutely, it's it's something that you'll see. Once you learn it, you'll see it in a lot of the ways I do things. And a lot of the discussion that I do as well. So um, it, it, I think it's always a nice way to, to uh, approach gardening. And, and it's not just permaculture. There are lots of other philosophies, lots of other methods out there. And so my approach is like we've been talking about today, look at what didn't go right or look at what did go right in my garden this year in particular. What are the lessons that I can learn from this year? And then as I start doing some research, try to figure out why, I'm always asking the question why, why did my cherry tomatoes do so well this year? Why did my cucumbers do so well this year? Why didn't some of my plants, like my zucchini? I had zucchini, but this was one of the, the worst years of zucchini. The plants did great, but I didn't get the harvest. Why didn't I get the harvest this year? And so as you start focusing on, on those questions, those why questions, and you start investigating and doing more research, you'll discover things like permaculture and no-dig gardening and all the other things that, that I refer to from time to time. And you can start developing your own philosophy within your garden and put the pieces together however you want. I, I really don't recommend that, you, that you, you choose one way of doing it and only do it that way. I think you really are missing out on a lot of opportunities in, in other areas. And so back to Eden gardening has some good methods. It doesn't work for everybody everywhere. And if you add that to your mix, again, you can figure out the why it's working or why it's not working, as opposed to just saying, I'm gonna be a back to Eden gardener. And the concept behind back to Eden is deep, deep mulch in your garden. Works great in the in the Pacific Northwest where it was really developed. Doesn't work so well in a Colorado garden. I can use it in some areas like around my fruit trees, but it just doesn't work for me in my climate during the growing season. But I've incorporated some of the concepts in some areas of my garden. And so as you plan your, your 2024 garden, try to start picking out some of those things and figure out what's going to work for you, or at least something that you wanna to try to see if it's going to work for you. Now, uh, I, I, I wanna give a shout out to, to Jenna and to all the rest of you that are always suggesting things for for my videos and, and you're, you're watching. And one of the things, uh, Jenna, on um, uh, Facebook, I think it was, was it Facebook? or No, it was a comment to one of the videos, but she's been watching these live streams. And so I've been doing these live streams now for more than three years, almost every week for more than three years, three and a half years. And she started from the beginning and she's watching all of these live streams. We're talking hundreds and hundreds of hours of information. And she suggested to me that I put the date in the description. Now I number these live streams because all those years ago, I got a suggestion from a viewer that said, can you number these live streams so that I know the order that you are presenting them? Well, the, the point that Jenna made as she's watching each one in order, she was on number 42 when she made the comment, 
is put the date so that you can understand what time of year the video is. And usually the background corresponds. So if I am showing one of your backgrounds and it's green and, it, and you've got flowers and fruit, it's probably one of these live streams in summertime. And during the winter, I'll put a background like my garden today to show that we're talking about winter. But you can expect to see in the description from here on out, I'll be putting the date that we're presenting this live stream. And so thank you to Jenna and to all of you who offer suggestions, offer ideas for topics for videos and, and really help me continue with the Gardner Scott channel in my in me making the decisions of, of what I'm going to do and when I'm going to do it. Uh, I'm, I'm planning a video. It, uh, right now, it's going to come out at the end of this month. So those of you that, that are a member of the Gardner Scott channel at the collaborator level, I'm going to be making a members only video that shows you some of the behind the scenes planning that I, I do for my videos. And I've already got the 2024 plan laid out for the first two months of what the videos are that I'm going to make. And then underneath that, I have dozens and dozens of video ideas that I want to make a video about. Often, I'll have a plan for the video I'm going to release. But if I get three or four five, sometimes even one suggestion in a video comment that you're looking for something or you're asking a question for something and hoping that I can help. If it's on my video list, I'll often go ahead and make that video and move it up the list and release it soon after that question or comment was asked. So I do listen to you, I do seek your input, and I do appreciate all of your comments and all of your suggestions, because even though I've got a plan in place of what my videos are going to be, I can modify that plan to, to fit what you specifically might be looking for. So, so please participate. Ask me some of those questions. Give me some of those suggestions. And even if it's as simple as add a date to the description, I, I can do that. And many years ago, I had a suggestion about my videos to number them. And same reason. He wanted to watch all my videos in sequence, but he didn't know what order they were in. And so in my description, I've been doing this for at least four years now. All my videos have a number in the description to tell you just exactly what video it is if you want to start watching them in order. And so uh, it's it's fun. I, I do this not only for me to document what I'm doing in my garden and to help me learn more so that I can present it to you, but I also do it because I know that it is, is helpful for you. And that's why I seek out the information that you can give me to make it that much easier. So. If you happen to be available in a couple hours, join me and Tony O'Neill on the Simplified Gardening channel, and we'll talk winter gardening. And I'll be back next week. Heads up, Christmas and New Year's this year is on a Monday. And so I won't have a show on Christmas, and I won't have a show on New Year's. So next Monday will be the last live stream of 2023. Hope to see you there. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being such a great supporter. I'm Gardener Scott. Enjoy gardening.